Rebecca Dorge. I'm the head of the Department of Statistics here at Purdue. Um, and it is my honor to uh, celebrate George Casella's uh, life. Um, I knew George uh, from being a postdoc at Cornell. I just finished my PhD and went to Cornell, uh, what was then the uh, plant breeding and biometry unit. Um, and I didn't know George beforehand, and he uh, just always put himself in front of me and offered to help, and he was a great mentor and became a wonderful friend. Um, and he had a rather large hand in bringing me to Purdue. Um, he, he is a huge Purdue fan, he's an alum. Um, and he, uh, those of you who know George, he had a very strong opinion about me coming here and uh, insisted um, pretty much that this was the place for me. Um, so I've been in contact with uh, Lauren McIntyre, who is a friend from graduate school. She, spent, she was on faculty here at Purdue, and now that she's at the University of Florida, she uh, became a colleague and a very good friend of the Casellas. So um, I've been in contact with her since Sunday night. And um, Anne is very grateful that we're doing this, and we extend our sympathies to the Casella family. This is being videoed, and we will make it available to everybody. We've had lots of requests for that. Um, George uh, suffered from melanoma about uh, eight years ago and underwent a bone marrow transplant, which was um, successful, and he was pretty much in remission for about eight years. And uh, then in November of 2011, um, he had another bone marrow transplant, and they thought it was successful. And I think in the spring sometime, they realized that uh, it wasn't successful. So in George's true style, he decided to hit it hard with a five cocktail chemo drug. And they really thought that that was going to do it. And he became very weak um, earlier, uh, last week, I guess. I don't really understand the timing too well. Um, but uh, he was in the hospital for about a week and was working. He was writing a book and he was writing papers and sending emails. And uh, they thought that actually he was uh, getting better. And then Friday night, Saturday, um, he had a kidney failure. And I have some notes here that uh, uh, Anne said was okay to sort of talk about. Um, so th this, this is what was, was written to me. So through all of the treatments, he was writing papers in a new book. He chose not to go to ICU, and instead on Saturday, he elected to disconnect and um, take morphine. Uh, he was clear, he was forceful, we can imagine what that meant. Um, and uh, he was clear and forceful until the morphine kicked in. In short, he spent very little time dying and a whole lot of time living, and that's what we wanna celebrate here tonight is all the time that he spent living. And uh, through the pictures, you can see that uh, he was all over the world with tons of people having a great time. Um, what I learned from George is uh, George, George um, hung out with people who worked hard. He liked to, to be around people who worked hard. And towards that end, I have a couple uh, emails that were sent to me that people asked me to read, and then uh, we'll get on with the program. So uh, Lauren McIntyre, who I've already mentioned, um, has been a, a colleague and a huge uh, help to the Casella family during these times, sent the following email. Um, she said that uh, George decided he wanted to learn more about genetics, and John Davis, who is a faculty member in forestry at the University of Florida, decided that he wanted to know more about uh, statistics. So the functional genomics discussion group was born at the University of Florida. Uh, they met on Thursday afternoons, and it was George and John, and depending on what topic, several other um, scientists at the uh, University of Florida. And then when Lauren arrived at the University of Florida, she was quickly uh, included into this team. Lauren's a New Yorker, George is a New Yorker. They were both super loud, and you get them in one room together, and uh, you definitely knew that they were in a meeting, uh, for sure. Um, she says that it, uh, the meetings were successful because they were, for, they were um, fueled by George's willingness to admit that he didn't know something, and, and he didn't know basic biology, and he would say it. And uh, he wasn't condescending or shocked when someone on the biology side didn't know something about statistics. He made everybody feel comfortable um, and uh, wanted everyone to learn. 
Lauren went on to say that this made, uh, made it silly for anyone else to bluff or posture, and instead everyone actually learned something um, every week that they met. He was a delight. He, he delighted in learning new things, and was con his uh, delight was contagious. And uh, very soon, the Thursday afternoons became a cherished part of the intellectual life at the University of Florida Genomic Center. Um, she goes on to say that George was a fantastic mentor and collaborator. He pushed hard, which uh, we all know that. Uh, he asked uh, questions with a gleam in his eye, like a kid in a candy store, and uh, he always pushed you, and he'd say, oh, can you do that model tomorrow? Can you, can you get me that data? Can you finish the simulation by Thursday, when in fact it was Tuesday and he was only giving you two days? Um, I can't wait to see what it looks like. He was so interested and he was excited and he believed that you could literally do anything if you worked really, really hard. Um, and so you did it. You stayed up late. You worked hard because you just didn't want to disappoint him. Um, you ended up being a better, you ended up being better than you thought just because uh, you didn't want to disappoint George. And I think that what Lauren said um, echoes in how I felt about George. And it's really important for me tonight to make this very nice and uh, a happy event celebrating his life because uh, that's how he would want it. Um, Shaoli uh, Meng from Harvard um, uh, tells this uh, story about how years ago George called him on the phone and asked him to consider serving uh, as an editor of a major statistics journal. He doesn't say which one. Um, and uh, Shaoli asked George, so how much time is spent as an editor? You know, what, what's the time sink here? And George said that he spent about four hours a day. So Shaoli said, uh, you know, I'm very honored that you asked, but I just don't have that sort of time and, and I can't do it. I'm, I'm already just so overcommitted. And George yelled at him and said very loudly, Shaoli, what are you talking about? I don't ask people who are not overcommitted. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so there was no such thing as overcommitment to George. Uh, indeed, he uh, was a living example of what uh, Shaoli calls the Hilbert Hotel. There was always one more room for a newly arrived commitment. Um, so tonight, uh, we are going to hear from other friends, um, and uh, we are going to celebrate uh, George's life. Uh, Jean Huang, who is in the math department at Cornell and was there when I was a postdoc and spent many, many years at Cornell with uh, George, will be the first to speak. It's a great honor for me to uh, be here to talk about uh, George Casella. And we are trying to get this uh, PowerPoint working, but, um, oh, here it is. OK, so here's, here's the title of my presentation, George Casella, Statistics, Marathons, Firefighting, Wine, and French. And uh, this will continue going. Uh, so my uh, story about uh, George will start right here at Purdue University. And he graduated in 1977. And during that time, I, that was the first time I met him. Uh, I was a first year uh, graduate student here. Uh, and we are of the same age, but I just came to school later than he did. Um, and so he then went on to Rutgers and then he came to Cornell. I say he came to Cornell because at that time, I was at Cornell already, and I was there uh, to, with uh, Larry Brown uh, welcoming him. Um, and I calculated <laughs> a little bit, and Cornell period turned out to be the longest period of his academic uh, life. So, uh, and this will be uh, the period that I will focus on uh, in my uh, discussion uh, tonight. And so my, the first question I want to address was what it was like to work with him. And I focus on the sort of more gentle side tonight. Uh, so it must have been uh, in 1981. Uh, well, yes, he just arrived at Cornell. And uh, I went to his office because I knew that he was working on constructing confidence set center at James Stein. Estimator. It's a problem that I have been uh, intrigued about ever since uh, I was a graduate student under Professor Jim Berger, uh, who was also a Purdue 
when I was at Purdue. So uh, I went there and I saw his numerical calculation, uh, which was not uh, simulation, it was uh, numerical integrals, so those numbers are more precise. And he showed me the uh, numerical evidence that uh, uh, the Compton set center at the Gemstein would have higher coverage probability than the Compton set center at the naive estimator. We are talking about dimension at least three and we are talking about normal distribution. So right there we decided that we should have a theorem and we did uh, uh, prove a theorem later on. Uh, and so after all this messy uh, calculation, sorry, I will, I'm behind here. Uh, uh, now, one of the uh, talent that he had, uh, which was very treasure, was he would look at all this and then in about a week, uh, he would come back with uh, a paper in his hand with all the stories and you know, well-written article, well-typed, everything almost ready to go. Uh, and every time I received that uh, paper, I felt, oh, he was giving me a gift because, oh, I look at it so carefully. It was so interesting because I uh, could never figure out, could never guess what kind of story he's going to make out of it. So, uh, well, that's probably an exaggeration, but uh, a lot of time he surprised me by how well he put it all together in a story. But neither do we uh, know that that was just beginning of my collaboration with him. We ended up writing 12 papers all together, including a recent one. So 11 papers, I should go back probably, 11 papers written while he was at Cornell. Uh, he commented one time that uh, we, would, we help each other to earn our tenure. He's a very uh, uh, sharing person. He even offered me to write a book together. He wanted to write a graduate textbook, uh, and he offered me that privilege. And he uh, well known that this means that he will be doing all, most, almost all the writing himself because I was struggling with my English at that time. And uh, so, uh, so it was really very sharing on his part. And I foolishly rejected that. And so it, he went on and uh, apparently work with uh, uh, Roger Berger, and so it became the book by Casella and Roger Berger. <laughs> now, so what was it like to work with him? We didn't see each, mu each other that much, only once every week, uh, because we were in different department, and uh, so, uh, and different buildings. Uh, so, but each time when we were together, we uh, tried to cheer each other, he cheer me a lot of times, and when we finish a paper, he give me a five. <laughs> it was really a very exciting time. Now think about it, it was almost like running a marathon with him, uh, with cheering crowd behind us. The crowd was very small, it was just him and me cheering each other, but I, why I think of marathon, because it's tough to be in the academic world, as many of you know. It's like running a marathon, isn't it? Now, I want to uh, talk about George's other life uh, interests, and it's impossible for me to tell you all because he has so many. And I suspect that even though uh, many of his friends are here, none of us really know uh, this side of story that well, and include that include myself. But anyhow, uh, you know, he likes to run marathons. And he also uh, was a volunteer firefighter, which, which I admire very much because I sometimes hear a story about how, when I ask him that how he saved somebody's life and people were very appreciative of him. Now, uh, maybe you are not aware of this, but he took a wine testing course at Cornell and he took a uh, French course at Cornell try to speak French. I do not know how well he ended up doing in that regard, but uh, people probably can comment on that. Now, uh, 
he uh, naturally was interested in the cultural differences. So I talked to him about Chinese culture. And I, more importantly for me, I learned a lot of American culture from him. And so uh, occasionally, we would go to his home uh, and have a meal. And uh, one time, Chris Robert was there. And so uh, he, I mean, he, you know, he, he's always very interested at parties, have interesting stuff to say. And so he, would turn to, he turned to me and say, uh, Gene, you know, and, and I know you know, that uh, Chinese people uh, would not think that a meal is complete without rice. And so he said, here is rice. And then he, he turned to uh, Chris Robert and said, oh, you know, for French, uh, a meal is not complete without wine. And here is wine. So we were both very happy that night. And, and then I want to tell you a story about uh, vinegar. OK. Um, well, one of these uh, few occasions, he came to uh, my house with uh, Chris Robert to have a meal together. And he uh, wore this beeper, and he explained it to me that uh, when the beeper went off, then he would have to go out and put out the fire. Very exciting comment, isn't it? Uh, it turns out the beeper never really went off that night. <laughs> So it's OK. We have him. And uh, so what, what about this story of vinegar? So I, we try to uh, serve them wine. You know, George like wine, and French helps to have wine. So we try to serve them wine. So uh, we put the wine on the table, and I went to Basel, and I came back. And all this wine were gone. And I couldn't figure out why. Had they drunk all the wine? during this period? Well, it turned out that much later, uh, I don't remember how it was revealed to me, but I think it was my wife who told me that uh, it turns out the wine did not pass George's uh, tasting. <laughs> it, it actually tastes like, like vinegar, uh, according to George. And so uh, he put it away. He took, took it away and threw it probably into the garbage to save the embarrassment on my part. So that night, he did not put out fire. But uh, now thinking about it, he did put out the fire of embarrassment on my part. So it was a very gentle moment. I can think of many other gentle moments uh, when we were together. I really uh, appreciate uh, this occasion of uh, sharing the uh, stories and, and, and talk to people here at this Purdue Symposium. Uh, it is pretty hard uh, when you have an academic brother who died, you feel that uh, your heart uh, is void, void in somewhere. And it's a difficult time, but I especially want to thank the organizers. I know a lot of people organize this conference, and this allow us to talk about George. And it's uh, a very uh, therapeutic experience, uh, this conference it is, uh, other than the academic, uh, exciting academic activities. I particularly want to thank Rebecca Dodge for organizing this memory session. And it's really very nice we can mourn together. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Bach, and I was a faculty member, uh, a new faculty member when George was here as a graduate student. As a matter of fact, Jim Berger and I, who will speak next, came in the same year in 1974 when George received his master's here. So George was an extraordinary graduate student. And of course, because I was a new faculty member, I didn't realize at the time what an extraordinary graduate student it's only, he was. It was only years later you start comparing, you think, oh my gosh, he was an incredible person. 
Um, he was a great scholar. He had that curiosity, that energy that, you know, separates those people. Um, but it was very interesting. He, in 1998, uh, he came back because he received a Distinguished Alum Award from the department. And at that time, he revealed that um, when he received the offer of funding as a graduate student at Purdue, he was bragging to his family about it. He said, you know, good school, you know, great program. And they said to him, and where is it? He said, not sure. <laughs> he, um, he, of course, you know, was a, a, for the young faculty who were there, he was a great colleague. I mean, he played bridge and poker, and uh, that was the applied probability seminar, as it was referred to. Um, but, of course, he had a great effect on the other graduate students, too. So I actually um, talked to or emailed Mark Berliner, who was another graduate student here with him at the same time. They were actually roommates together. And Mark gave me some insights on the effect that George had on him. When he met George, uh, Mark was an undergraduate, and he wasn't sure what he was going to do with his life. Uh, he said his options were um, mountain climber, spy, roadie for the Rolling Stones. And George said, why don't you be a statistician? And he convinced him that was a great career. And as you know, Mark went on to do that. It was just, it was wonderful. So actually, he and George uh, became roommates for a couple of years. And Mark says, he was as good a friend as anyone could expect and also a role model. George showed me how to work hard and still have fun. And so Mark, of course, remembers the poker games and the bridge. And he refers to George's evil laugh when he won a pot at poker. Um, Together, they enjoyed the Thursday post-seminar cocktail parties, which was known as dinner to the graduate students. Um, he loved the annual Christmas party because there were roasts of the faculty. I uh, loved the autumn camping trips, the joint seminars with Illinois, many other seminars. And as Mark says, he left a void when he graduated for the faculty too. But he went on to be a leader in our discipline. He was an outstanding statistician, a role model, a teacher, and a mentor. And according to Mark, he's proud to be his friend. This curtain. Oh, hello. Do we have a picture? <laughs> picture yeah, that one. There, there's lots of curtains up here. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Oh. Well, as 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 Mary Ellen just said, um, both she and I met George when he arrived at Purdue in 1974. He was actually, at the time, just finishing up a master's degree in applied statistics. Uh, so, sort of back then, well, probably still now. I actually don't know what's going on. But the applied master's degree in statistics at Purdue was this fast-track educational experience to a high-paying job. George, being from New York, was attracted to this. Uh, I'm sure had visions of going back on, on Wall Street and getting quickly rich. Um, but something happened. He, he, he turned out to, 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 to not only be just a good applied statistics student, but he also realized that he was a good theoretical statistics student. And somehow or other, the, the faculty, I wasn't so much a part of this because I just came at the end of this, convinced him that his career was not necessarily getting rich, but in becoming, uh, uh, getting a PhD in statistics. 
and going on in the profession. Uh, it, it's, it's, it was actually, I think, a fairly close call. And, and, I, and, and when I was thinking about this um, uh, the other day, I was thinking what we would have lost if he had chosen to go for the money. Because uh, back then, a PhD was not a very lucrative thing to do. <laughs> maybe, maybe not yet either, but, uh, uh, but luckily for our profession, he stayed and got his PhD and went on to do so much, all, all that he's done for, for the profession. Uh, my memories that long ago are rather scattered. Uh, I, I actually know that, that, that uh, I wrote a paper with him at the time. In fact, in fact it was his first paper. Uh, the other co-authors probably don't even remember this. Mary Ellen was, and Larry was. <laughs> the, the other co-author was, was uh, his, his, his major advisor, Leon Glazer. Uh, so, so that was his first paper, and, and he was very excited and, and uh, continued working in that area for quite a while. Uh, I think as Mary Ellen mentioned, at that time the junior faculty uh, and grad students at Purdue, we basically hung out together. The poker parties were, were wonderful. I think, it was I think it was George who instituted the rule that we had to play outrageous poker games so that nobody could know the odds. That made it much more fun, because otherwise people get serious and start computing and it ruins the game. So we always played outrageous games and it was quite wonderful. Uh, I also remember George a lot. We, we, we took, I don't know if they, they still go on, but we took canoe trips on the, wild cat, on, the, on the Wild Cat Creek, I think that's what it's called. And one of the rules was we had to have gallon jugs of pina coladas along on the trip. Helped a lot. Uh, I, I followed George, uh, George's career very carefully because we ended up working uh, initially in a lot of the same areas. Uh, initially, shrinkage estimation was what we both did. Uh, then conditional frequentist theory. I, I mentioned this a, a bit yesterday in my talk. And then lately, uh, we've both been doing a lot of Bayesian testing and model selection. Uh, so so I've, I've followed his whole career uh, and, and just have been incredibly impressed at every stage. Um, of course, sort of yesterday when I realized I was, you know, or two days ago when I realized I was going to say something tonight, I took a look at his Vita and discovered that there were a dozen areas of research that he had been heavily involved in, which I knew nothing about. He, 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 was, he, was, he was not only uh, incredibly good in, in sort of the focused areas that I knew about, but in so many others, many of which were interdisciplinary. I visited George at Cornell in the early 80s, uh, but we, we didn't seriously connect again until he was on sabbatical here in 86, 87. And it was great having him around, and I think that's when I first met his wife, Anne. Uh, she was finishing up her degree at Cornell, I believe, and was periodically visiting here. And, and uh, it was wonderful not only seeing him again, but, but meeting uh, who was going to be this wonderful person in his life. Uh, the following year, my daughter, Jill, moved, moved uh, not moved to Cornell, but matriculated at Cornell, where she got her degree. And both Jean, who you heard earlier, and George were wonderful to her. Uh, I, I, th I, think I think she said that George uh, uh, broke all records in getting her moved into dorms at various times, by somehow managing to bypass all of the Cornell uh, lines as a good New Yorker would be able to do. Um, I, I'm not going to say much about George's scientific work, except I've already said it was amazing. A, a couple of years ago, I happened to be writing a letter, uh, uh, a recommendation letter for him for something or other, and I actually did one of these scans of his vitas. And I noticed that 30% of his hundreds of statistical papers were in either Annals of Statistics, JASA, or Biometrica. You know, that, that, that's, you know, I know a lot of people who are just waiting their lives to have five in those, and, and this is an amazing record. And his non-statistical papers, uh, I'm sure, were also in the best journals in the other sciences. I, I also know that, uh, know personally, that George's collaborators adored him. Uh, I more than once would get calls from very famous scientists in other disciplines who were, would be more or less telling me, why isn't George in the U.S. National Academy of Science? They, they couldn't understand why somebody who they perceived as being of this scientific caliber was not yet in the academy. George's pedagogical work, including his many classic textbooks, was, is, is also legend. And I, and I have to mention one small sidelight of this, and it actually relates to something that Jean said, is that in the late 90s, I was noticing that suddenly I would be visiting places, 
and all sorts of young people would be running up to me, very anxious and happy to meet me. And I was wondering what was going on. And then suddenly, they started producing books for me to autograph. And of course, the book was Statistical Inference by Casella and Berger. <laughs> and I had to explain, no, that's the wrong Berger. <laughs> Although, more than once, I decided to take credit for it. <laughs> But, but, but this was just a, a classic book that had such an influence on graduate education. Uh, uh, and like Jean, I wish I too had been a part of it. But alas, I don't have the name. Uh, George was remarkably effective at administration, whether as department chair, journal editor, whatever. Uh, almost everyone who's done it has had their, would have their life consumed by a major journal editorship. But, but George took these on almost casually. I mean, in fact, in fact, his latest one was while he was un under, under serious treatment for melanoma. And he said, sure, I can handle the editor editorship of JRSSB. Uh, and and, and, and that, was the, that was just the kind of, the kind of guy he did. He, he, that was the kind of energy he had. Um, I, I, I most lately appreciated George because I was, when I became director of SAMSI, he was invaluable to me and invaluable to SAMSI. He served on our initial scientific advisory board. He went on to be the ASA representative to the Samson e. Governing Board. Uh, it was the latest chances I had when he, when he would come to a meeting and he'd say, okay, I'll come to a meeting, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out, but then we, we have to have some quiet time with some wine afterwards. And sometimes he'd bring Anne to go birding also. And I, I remember those as especially fond memories. Um, George was a paragon of science, but when we think of him, we also, we also think of Anne and his children, uh, Ben and Sarah. Uh, Friday night with Anne's homemade pizza at Cornell in Florida were always memorable. George was so wonderful to his children, and it was in ways that also ended up being really good for society. Gene talked about his firefighting, so I was visiting, visiting him once, and. Although, although, although it wasn't, the, the beeper didn't go off. He had to go off to some firefighters meeting or something. And when he came back, uh, I was at, at their house and, and I said, now why exactly do you do this? And at first he said, well, you know, we, we only have a volunteer fire department in, in, my, in my neighbor, in, in, my, um, in the area I live, and so it's a, a citizen's responsibility to do this. And, and I just kind of stared at him a while. And he said, oh, and Ben thinks it's really, really cool. <laughs> Uh, later on, George and Anne decided it would be really good to immerse their children in Spanish culture. So they started making long visits to Spain uh, with their children. This ended up being great for the children, of course, but it, al but it also ended up being great for Spanish science. George contributed so much to statistics in Spain that in 2009 he was inducted into the Spanish Academy of Sciences. So, so uh, everything George touched, he, he, for whatever reason, uh, just turned to gold. He was, he was a remarkable statistician, an extraordinary human being, and it, and it was just a complete privilege to know him. So hi, uh, I'm Min Zhang, and I'm currently a faculty member here at Purdue. So it's an honor for me today to share some of my memories with George as a student. So George has been a great mentor and a role model for me. So he recruited me to Cornell when I first started my you know, statistical education. And also I didn't really have a chance to get a degree with him because he moved to uh, Florida, you know, but I have to stay at Cornell, you know, due to some family reasons. But since then, for the past many years, he has always been there whenever I need some guidance, suggestions. If I send an email, he will reply quickly, say, you know, give me those suggestions. So, so has, he has been really influential on the direction of my entire career. So I remember the first time when I met George in his office for an interview, and then he kind of asked me, all these questions like what's your background and what do you want to do? But the, all my background back to that time was only 
either my clinical experience as a physician or my research experience as a biologist, like doing experiment in the lab. I know really little about statistics, but I know I'm kind of generating a lot of data, but I don't know how to analyze them. And he kind of gave me a lot of, you know, real world examples of how statistics can be useful to realize what I really want to do in, in the rest of my life. So that kind of, you know, after the first conversation with him, I think he really made me believe that it's not really too late to learn statistics, I mean, to move into a whole different field even after, you know, get my PhD in biology already. And he also made me believe that, you know, I can do well in statistics, especially that, you know, he said, I remember clearly that your 12-year medical school experience will still be useful in the future of my career. And it turns out all this, you know, turns out to be, to be true in, the, in, the, in my future career. And uh, so I the other thing I remember is uh, during the first semester, and I went to him asking that what courses you know I need to take. So at first I thought there were some maybe some probability, some statistical courses, but instead he referred me to all the math courses and saying that you know these are the, really the foundations of statistics. And then later on, so those math courses I took really kind of helped me a lot in the long run that make my life much easier in my later, you know, uh, future career. So, and I was fortunate to take the statistical inference course with him while he was, uh, you know, revising his, you know, the inference book. And the, one of the biggest benefits is like uh, all uh, students in, in the class, we all get a free copy of the manuscript without buying the, the textbook. And also, uh, along the way, when he was giving lectures, he always, you know, kind of tell us, you know, the secrets about revising a book, about how do you, you know, write a book, and all those things. And also, that was actually so the first that course is more of like the basic course. But then I think uh, back to that time, he was, uh, meanwhile, he was the editor for for JASA. So he always brings those new ideas, the recent developments, well, you know, for those manuscripts submitted. And he said, oh, being the editor, this is the, the real kind of advantage to so a lot of new stories that he talk about in, in his lecture. So it's like, you know, everybody in the class enjoys lecture so much. And even a lot of you, because the cl classroom is always full, and a lot of students sitting there that I know that they already took the course, but they just want to sit there and enjoy. So it's like all of the enjoy every single minute of the course. It's, it's more like he's always so energetic and enthusiastic about each lecture and each, you know, each or so we just, you know, that's, that's the kind of, you know, the person we, we all, you know, kind of memory. So, and uh, so to keep this short, um, uh, I mean, it's uh, uh, basic for me that is the first conversation with him that kind of make me switch into the field of statistics. And it is the statistical inference course that I took with him that really made me fall in love with statistics and choose this as uh, the rest of my lifelong career. So I enjoyed, I basically enjoyed every single minute with him and my life has been changed permanently, you know, by George. And uh, I was uh, uh, so grateful that, you know, I was given the opportunity to have known him. Um, I'm um, honored to be here and to be given the opportunity to say a few things about George. Uh, I think I want to divide my comments into two parts. First, um, some informal memories that I have of George, and then uh, I want to read part of a statement that um, my colleague Ed George who was also a very close friend of George's, wrote for his uh, George's ceremony uh, 
and read um, last night, I think. Um, my own, my own uh, overwhelming uh, memory of George is his really irrepressible enthusiasm for virtually everything that he came across. And um, I think Ming said it also, uh, another adjective, another description of that enthusiasm was, was um, that it was infectious. Um, George could get enthusiastic about any number of things, uh, and you became enthusiastic too by virtue of his enthusiasm. Uh, so he was enthusiastic about his family, he was enthusiastic about statistics. Uh, as you've heard, he was enthusiastic about being a volunteer fireman. Now, I was never a volunteer fireman, but uh, when George was around, it was really tempting to try it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, he enjoyed mixing uh, with uh, a, a different group of people and, and understanding them uh, in that process of being a fireman. Um, uh, I, it hadn't come up, or maybe it came up indirectly from Gene, uh, but when we were at Cornell together, George was enthusiastic, over the top about New York State wines, and I believe he'd visited every winery uh, in the state, and many uh, not in the state that could claim to have some connection with the state. So he was really, at, and we, when we would go out to dinner, we would say, what should we order? And of course, it was always a New York State wine. That was what we expected. Um, and he knew all of them and their characteristics. Um, he was enthusiastic about learning language. So uh, uh, Gene talked about his uh, mastery of French and then his a little bit later, his uh, mastery of Spanish, and I, I looked up a, a, um, some comments that um, uh, Elias Moreno uh, did an interview with George published in, the, in ISBA in 2006, and George said, uh, first, I really enjoy trying to learn a language. And uh, George said, during the 90s when I was working a lot with Chris Robert and visiting France, I got reasonably good at French. But more importantly, George said, I think it's valuable to speak more than one language so that we can communicate our science to an even wider audience. So George was always trying to communicate uh, in the broadest way that he could to the most people that he could interest, um, interest in his science. And I actually think uh, it maybe if I tried to pass this on to George, he would sort of frown and laugh. Uh, and his really uh, memorable laugh. Um, but I kind of think that this has to do with his um, statistical philosophy and the way he did statistics as well, because he found valuable uh, ideas and, and attitudes in all uh, uh, realms of statistics, in particular in both in Bayesian and non-Bayesian paradigms. And he continually strived to explain all statistical aspects in the most comprehensible way, uh, whatever it was, uh, to all uh, whom he could get to listen. Um, it, it, a couple of other things I wanted to say before I go to the, uh, I thought to say before I, I go to the formal remarks. Um, he really was, uh, I mean, I, I've said it in, in one way, but he had universal, expansive, really omnivorous interests. And Jim has noted, uh, looking at his Vita, and I also did uh, look at it. And uh, it, like all of us, he added a few things that maybe, but only a few, that maybe don't quite live up um, to the, to the uh, standards of, of all the rest of his works. But he lists 117 publications in statistics, that is statistical theory. Uh, 47 more publications in statistical genetics and genomics, uh, and 34 publications in what he calls other fields. And of course, they're all statistics, uh, statistically based, but he worked on, and, and this is something that uh, when we were together at Cornell, uh, 
um, which we were for most of his career at, at Cornell, um, he was always excited about being able to use statistics in uh, all sorts of, of, of different ways um, and in different fields. So there's a paper on um, uh, microscopic life of a salt marsh. There's a paper on tomato fruit col color as in influenced by temperature and humid humidity. Uh, another one on variability in the use of soup kitchens in New York State. Um, variation in the volume, this is something I remember him talking about uh, because we had a, uh, uh, a large bird, uh, one of the key specialties in, in the agriculture school is a study of ornithology. And so he wrote a paper on variation in the volume of the zebra finch song. Um, and of course, uh, he has several papers on the length of productive life and the amount of productivity of dairy cows, one, two, and three. Um, which, um, so, uh, and all of these things were part of his enthusiasm and part of what he passed along and, and things that we, and he would bring to our luncheons and, and, and dinners from time to time. Uh, two other things I wanted to mention. Uh, his enthusiasm could extend to being uh, enthusiastically worked up, shall we say. Um, Ed has a story, and then I have another anecdote that um, I debated with myself, but I think I'll share. Uh, Ed's story has to do with uh, playing golf at Cornell when they were um, together one time uh, early on uh, in George's career there. Um, uh, George um, hit a ball into the lake uh, at Cornell, um, and Ed said immediately afterwards um, his five iron went arcing into the lake. Um, and um, George grinned and said he had taught that golf, golf club a lesson it would never forget. <laughs> so even when he was angry, he was enthusiastically <laughs> angry. Um, uh, and there, I had another uh, kind of experience with him. Uh, 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 Jim mentioned uh, George's um, administrative abilities. Well, his administrative abilities were mixed, but very successful. Uh, I went away for a year on leave uh, at Cornell, um, and George took over as director of the Statistics Center. The uh, expectation was that George would take the next term as director of the Statistics Center, and that was a, it was a good term coming up. We had been promised space uh, finally, in, in, uh, in, 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 admittedly in the attic of an old building um, on, on the Ag campus, but we'd been promised this space and um, uh, George was looking forward to uh, expanding the activities and, and office and we would get some offices for graduate students. We all, all of that did take place when I came back. Uh, the only thing is that George had resigned, uh, enthusiastically resigned as director of the center uh, and left it to me to take over as director of this nicely renovated uh, attic. I mean, it, it was still an attic, but it, they had really done a nice job of it, and George had run up a debt of about $100,000. Um, which he thought the deans were going to pay for. And I don't know what the deans thought, if they did any thinking. But anyway, um, he enthusiastically resigned and enthusiastically left me the job of placating the deans for the remainder of my period at Cornell. Every year, this was a topic that would come up. And I would say, well, that was the former director. And we will pay it off sometime. Um, <laughs> So that's how it worked. Uh, I guess we were kind of a, a, a tandem that way. Um, so uh, uh, I could share some more experiences, but I think that that will sort of pass along.
the, the feeling. Um, I wanted to read these remarks from that, uh, that Ed wrote. Um, Ed, if you know him, is a fairly gushy personality. I can't duplicate Ed except to read what he wrote, but I, uh, in this case, I, um, I think he hit the, hit the mark pretty well, and so um, Ed wrote, to our dear friend, George. George, dear friend, our hearts are breaking. This wasn't supposed to happen. We were supposed to grow old together and to be enriched by your presence. We are crushed by your absence. We wish you could see the outpouring of love for you. It's a reflection of the love you gave. You will live on in our hearts and in the many bonds we now share with each other, your friends, because of you. You were good, I mean really good. I mean really, really good at everything, family, friendship, scholarships, enjoyment of life. You were so good at everything you set your mind to. How did you manage it all? Well, maybe you weren't that good at golf, but that's another story. <laughs> you were the consummate good guy. Your inherent goodness, a fund fundamental part of your character, coupled with your amazing generosity of spirit, has truly been a model for us all. You were magic. Students, colleagues, whoever came in contact with you seemed to magically blossom. Your enthusiasm for any problem was contagious. It was as if you brought us along on your every journey to share your view, and what a beautiful view it was. And you did this for everyone. All your PhD students, all your co-authors describe the same phenomenon. Wherever you went, your enthusiasm and your brilliant insights seemed to ignite a firestorm of research activity. George, you are surely a giant. You are truly a giant among us. Well, not literally a giant. <laughs> um, and I can hear your wonderful laugh at be de being described as a giant. Um, but your power to inspire us through your books, your papers, your talks, your hard work, and most of all through your conversation and your presence was unsurpassed. We are hurting without you. You will always be with us and we with you. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and uh, I think we'll always remember George for what he contributed to statistics, whether you're a student and you took a class from um, Casella and the other burger, <laughs> or uh, you got to witness George's um, short fuse, which I witnessed that at Cornell quite a few times. Uh, most of the time it was over budget, so he yelled extra loud then. Um, uh, I think the most important thing that we take away from tonight is his example his enthusiasm, um, his dedication to what we do. Um, and uh, I think that uh, if he were here tonight, and he is here tonight, uh, he would just say, you know, let me be an example and uh, take, take the message forward and live your life forward. Because, you know, if I learned one thing from George, it was live your life forward and uh, live it to the fullest. So thank you very much for coming. Um, and we'll run through the pictures one more time for you. Thank you, and thank everyone who spoke. Um, is there anyone in the audience that would like to say something? We have some floor mics that we can distribute. Okay, if you change your mind, they're, they're live, come on up. Thank you. <laughs>